Good afternoon everyone, yes I am back to the land of low friction, so very pleased to be uh, back having a, a chat with you all. Uh, thank you for all the well wishes for the holidays, overall had a grand old time apart from of course as one does on holidays you get sick for like a week, but uh, apart from that uh, it was all a bunch of fun. At least I took uh, I guess a week to have a, a long rest, so there was a fair bit of couch time uh, during that period. Um, and yeah, before I went on leave, I was having a bit of fun with just um, the first quick record on the, the new computer because yeah, being a, a desktop, we actually had a hum that was coming through the microphone. It's apparently a vibration thing that they uh, pick up. So we have acoustic board now under the new computer and acoustic board uh, glued onto the base of the microphone. Quick test, it seems to be, I, I can't detect it on the, uh, the playback on my setup here. Hopefully we have a annoying background, either fan noise or humming from the microphone. Um, no more of that with uh, fingers crossed going forwards, but let me know if that's still there. And I'll keep playing around with trying to insulate things out further. Uh, speaking of the new computer, uh, I'd like to take a quick moment just to say a uh, yeah, huge thanks to a long-term customer and uh, supporter by the name of Craig. Uh, so do get uh, you know the old support obviously come through uh, via the super thanks on YouTube. I don't have Patreon or anything like that set up and I've never looked at uh, any sort of sponsorship or advertising. Um, but you know obviously any that extra support that comes through really does help. So you know the, the model that Zero Friction Cycling has where the genuine best products that we find through our extremely time consuming and robust testing um, are the products that we sell through the Zero Friction Cycling retail store. Uh, that you know makes that um, testing side you know physically possible. Uh, it's really extremely difficult to try to have a testing business that survives just on paid testing by companies that want to pay you to test. And one of the big issues with only doing paid testing is that a lot of that testing remains obviously private because it's only really if that company wins the testing that they're going to want to go public with the test results uh, from that test facility. So mostly you don't see a lot out there from any other test uh, labs that actually do exist out there in the world. So really being able to you know, build up a large lead table over the years and have so much you know, open data and information that, that we can try to provide in this area, we've really needed to have that open model and you know obviously a model that we've been very um, open with from the beginning so that people can hopefully not get confused about you know the independence of zero friction cycling some still do but they are more special cases 99.999% um, of the time uh, everyone understands you know the model that we've had in place but um, yeah I mean I would say we certainly work a lot of hours um, to you know get the I guess the the revenue margin back to be able to help cover uh, the testing side and then have something left over to have a viable uh, business. Um, so the cost of the computer, for instance, so it was a basically $2,000 uh, Australian new computer. We have to sell around $8,000 worth of chains and lubricants um, to make back a sort of a net around $2,000. So it's a lot of chains and, uh, and bottles of lubricant or wax that you have to um, process, you know, orders and get out the door and liaise with customers and inquiries and support and so on. So just to make um, a net 2000 to sort of repurchase a piece of equipment like that. Um, you know, so to have that uh, support donation through from, uh, you know, from a, a customer, that's you know, extremely flattering and, uh, and heartfelt touching. So thank you, Craig, for that support. It really does help enormously. And uh, obviously, yeah, helps, um, you know, ZFC just keep, uh, Doing the work that we're doing to try to provide the best information uh, that we can and uh, you know really delving deeper into ever more information into a few spaces that we want to get into in the future so yeah uh hugely appreciated and um all right let's get into a couple of uh little low friction topics before we go to the main um video theme today all right we just need to get to um it's a question that's been coming up more frequently and yeah, the Northern Hemisphere is about to start to head into more inclement weather. So it's going to be coming up a bit more often as well. Um, one of the tips for immersive waxes is that you know if you've done a ride out in some pretty harsh conditions, be it on-road or off-road, um, is that giving your chain a boiling water flush rinse or two 
uh, when you get home and before you re-wax is a great way to just melt off the, the remainder of um, the, the old wax that's on the chain that's going to have a whole bunch of crap uh, thrown into it from water running right through your chain. And you can save yourself, you know, bringing a whole bunch of crud into your wax pot. You, you know, would obviously prefer not to bring that into your wax pot and keep the wax in there lovely and silky smooth and amazing and not containing any abrasive stuff. So that's been, yeah, the common uh, sort of tip and, and just great easy way to be able to do a great clean of your chain for immersive waxes without having to faff with solvents and things like that. But the question uh, that comes up is, do I need to dry my chain before I re-wax or am I fine just to re-wax it wet? And there's been some <clears throat> sort of conflicting information between what uh, so myself for Zero Friction Cycling have advised and M-Speed Wax versus what's um, been uh, advised via another sort of main uh, company in the space with uh, Silk and Silk Velo. Normally we're pretty much aligned on all sort of waxing things, but this is an area where we have had a difference where Zero Friction Cycling and MSW have always said uh, that you should dry the chain before you re-wax it, um, whereas Silk have advised that it's fine, just re-wax the chain wet. So what's been the sort of, the, I guess, the difference between the messages? Okay, so what's been, I guess, behind the message from myself and M Speed Wax to start with? Um, M Speed Wax had done some, uh, I guess, a good batch of testing in the space uh, a while ago because uh, they wanted to know, I guess, the answer themselves. Um, and so they did a whole bunch of re-waxing uh, chains wet, um, cut open the wax after uh, that had set, and they did find that there were some wax, um, you know, puddles, sorry, wax puddles, water puddles in the wax. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Wax puddles in your wax. Uh, so, the, you know, the presence of water um, in the wax is, is not a good sign. It, it wasn't all evaporating out, even though they had obviously given it plenty of time to, uh, to do so. Uh, so I had taken on board that uh, information from them. And also, I guess, just really married up with um, a lot of years now um, having sold M Speed Wax and other waxes to, and we sell a lot. You know, we do sell, you know, on average now over 2,000 uh, units of M Speed Wax plus hot melt uh, per year the last few years. So we've got a lot of waxing customers and obviously a sort of compounding waxing customer base of many thousands. So um, each year we probably get about, you know, there's maybe five to 10 cases of where a customer who has switched to immersive waxing and they really have not attained the you know the lifespan from their chain on immersive waxing that they're expecting and in some cases it's been you know quite well short so we know something's really amiss and in probably nine out of ten cases with uh, you know chatting with the customer we sort of found that you know it's just interesting that they have been someone who has boiled sort of boiling water rinse flushing their chain every single time before they re-wax uh, and in some cases it's you know, really just being cyclists who ride in on the road in dry conditions. Uh, if you, you know, post dry riding, you really road or off road, uh, the boiling water rinses aren't going to do anything for you. Um, the, the dust isn't, you know, especially road, there's so little dust anyway for immersive waxes because it's a solid lubricant out in road. Um, you're just wasting electricity, time, and water and increasing potential risk of getting water in your wax. Uh, even dry off-road though, the dust just really doesn't penetrate uh, that deeply into the chain. You can remove the bulk of dust from the outside of the chain with just a quick uh, you know, alcohol spray onto a microfiber cloth. Remove that surface dust that is stuck to the outside of the chain from the static electricity of the chain zooming through the air. Uh, and then re-wax. So you're bringing a tiny amount of you know, dust into your pot each time. The boiling water flush rinses are not a perfect clean. They're not a really deep clean. They are just a bulk level clean that, that works great after a wet ride where water has brought a whole bunch of crap right through your chain because the water runs right through your chain and whatever the water is carrying it's going to get deep inside the chain be pressed into the wax that's uh that's running inside there and you know getting rid of that before you re-wax is great and especially as you saw from the picture off-road you can save a whole bunch of crap coming in quite easily so but yeah looping back um it was just became quite interesting over time that you know, really probably at least sort of around that nine out of 10 cases of, of premature wear, we would find that the customer was boiling water, flush rinsing every single time, and they either were not drying or drying what happens with some, if they're doing it every single time, they can get a little bit lax on 
um, drying the chain before they re-wax. So just they really start to skimp on it. And so, you know, that, I guess, anecdotal uh, experience and also married to the fact that when they stop doing that behavior, the next take two batch uh, of chains was all fine. So we've got some pretty strong anecdotal evidence from you know, customers out in the field now over the years that really matched M-Speed waxes you know, testing. Now, I don't know how much they, uh, you know, anecdotal experience similar that they have, but we have a pretty strong match there as to we probably really shouldn't. Uh, so what was behind sort of Silka saying it's fine. So I did manage to finally have a chat with uh, Josh about that. And so your Silka had done their own testing as well and managed to, you know, they attained a very different result. And we sort of, we think we figured out why. Um, so really the slow cookers that we tend to have here in Australia will, you know, on low, which is the recommended setting uh, because the high can get the wax a bit too hot. Um, the wax will get to most times around 70 to 90 degrees and that's perfect. Anywhere in that window is great. Um, but that is not necessarily hot enough to properly evaporate all the water. Um, and the pot that uh, M Speed Wax have, uh, they so they their official recommendations is 90. They do things textbook, their pot's 90. So uh, same story that they had there. Um, the pot that M Speed Wax, uh, sorry, that Silka have, uh, I believe it was, I think it was around 105 degrees Celsius. So it's getting it to over 100 degrees. Uh, so it, I think that some crock pots in uh, potentially North America and potentially throughout Europe, uh, even on the low setting, are perhaps getting uh, the wax to over 100 degrees, which is going to be, you know, much more likely to evaporate the water out. Obviously, once it's over 100, so it could that could well, we think is literally the difference. And um, so I'm going to really probably stress my advice because I don't think that it's going to be assured that everybody in uh, the northern hemisphere is going to have a crock pot or slow cooker that on the recommended low setting is getting it to over 100 degrees and really um, 100 degrees is okay 105 and 5 degrees is okay uh, 110 is really starting to sort of reach the upper happy limit of the paraffin um, really once you start to get around that point especially if you're leaving it there for a while you can start to get into the temperature that that can start to break down the long chain molecules of the paraffin and that can start to damage its lubricity. So you've got a bit of a narrow window if you're sort of wanting to be in the thing, I can just re-wax my chain wet and I'm gonna run my pot over 100 degrees Celsius. So I'd just, I'd be cautious of going that path. The recommended path is going to be still, you know, just dry the chain. So hair dryer or heat gun, literally for two or three minutes after you have done your boiling water flush rinses, Pop the chain on top of the wax, turn the pot on low, and by the time the, the wax is melted, everything should be all fine and dandy. Whatever tiny amount is left is going to be too small. Um, you know, the heat really does help. So as opposed to cold compressed air from, say, maybe an air compressor, uh, hairdryer, heat gun, two or three minutes, really heats up the chain, really evaporates out the water from deep inside the chain. And, you know, we, again, now for sort of what, seven years deep in selling wax, uh, we haven't had any cases of, uh, of you know, issues with people doing boiling water flush rinses if they are uh, drying their chain before they re-wax. So that is going to remain the, um, the official recommended advice from Zero Friction Cycling and M-Speed Wax is that yes, you should. So sorry, it's, a, it's an extra two, three minute step. Um, and only do it, it's only worth doing post proper wet rides. If it's been a dry ride, don't bother with your boiling water rinse. If it's a dry road ride, don't boiling water rinse, flush clean your chains. Don't, and some I still hear of some customers that uh, even though they only ride on the road, before they re-wax, they clean it again with terps and metho, which does absolutely nothing except waste ter terps and metho, just re-wax. Um, you know, again, don't worry about what uh, tiny amount you bring into your, your wax pot. Um, you know, just remember what things were like in the drip lube days where you were adding say three mil of wax lubricant or wet lubricant across over 100 links of chain. You've got like 0.03 mil of fresh lubricant going onto each link um, and over the top of whatever contamination is in there, you're putting your chain in a bath of hundreds of mil of 100% lubricant. It takes a very, very long time for what contamination is in your wax pot to approach 
what you are experiencing in your pre-waxing days. So yeah, you really don't need to stress, um, especially if you're dry road riding about things like boiling water, flush rinse, or other solvent cleans of your wax chain before you re-wax. Enjoy the wonderful world of immersive waxing by just popping the chain off, putting it in its bath. Um, and yeah, it's great post um, proper wet rides, great post, especially off-road muddy wet rides, uh, as you saw there. Uh, that's what it's really used for. Dry the chain, wax, and yeah, everything will be amazing. All right, oh my goodness, we are here. I do apologize, it took uh, a bit longer than planned indeed to get to uh, releasing the candle wax test result. Uh, so yeah, if you'd followed uh, the sort of weeks prior to my, um, my holidays, uh, just the computer issues were driving me a bit crazy and running me so far behind that uh, despite having planned to get to it for a number of weeks, it just couldn't happen. Amazing what a working computer does to, uh, to one's life, so here we are. Um, now, yeah, I, uh, I'll do a couple of quick preambles before we get to the data on the, uh, the candle wax. Um, all right, so for one, uh, despite uh, overall, I do have a fair bit of um, you know, limitations on what I can do with regards to testing DIY waxing. And there's no grand conspiracy uh, to that because at the end of the day, if you're happy with your DIY waxing and it's rocking your world and you don't think you need to spend some big bucks on the commercial waxes, stay happy. You don't need zero friction cycling validation of uh, you know, DIY wax blend X uh, to, to tell you that you're happy. Um, it's just an area that you know there are so many different requests for DIY wax testings that it's just I could spend a hundred years testing DIY waxes and still uh, wouldn't be pleasing um, you know half of the DIY wax world so you know that's one part um, but I do agree like it has been really good to actually get a uh, candle wax tested and I do want to try to get um, a really I guess sort of well regarded uh, food grade paraffin um, canning wax tested as, a, as another benchmark as well, so I will try to get to that. Um, but yeah, I do agree, it's good to get a candle wax uh, test done. Uh, so we'll have some, some fun results there. But, so just preamble part number two, um, and not to give too much of the excitement away, uh, or the, uh, the, yeah, this, the, the anticipation, the candle wax that I tested uh, overall did really well, um, and it was really, um, quite clean things just ran overall quite impressively my fear because i know what's out there i know what's uh, what i've seen and i know what other mechanics have seen the the risk with this review um, is that you know candle wax is really cheap stuff and it's different um, so this is going to really be i guess a candle wax anecdotal test of n equals one your experience with candle wax may well vary and it may well vary quite a bit so it's really some of the the sort of DIY waxing that that has on occasion given immersive waxing a pretty bad rap by way of you know what the bike store mechanic sees is a horrific gunked up mess that is a nightmare job to try to clean and you know things can be so gunked up that the you know um, it's not able to shift properly and it's it's really not a not a good time so, you know, my fear is that, you know, I, I appear to have obviously stumbled across quite a good one. And so I'll post obviously the link up to what I purchased if you want to go with the same uh, candle wax, if candle waxing is your, uh, your path uh, that you want to go down. Um, others on a different candle wax or, you know, sort of cheap paraffin from a hardware store or eBay. Just please note that your experience may vary um that as really as well as this candle wax test went overall i can't endorse that that is going to be what you're going to get from your candle waxing um, so i hope that makes sense without me rambling too horrifically um, yeah it's just ex it's an extremely variant product the oil content other impurities like soy palm oil things like that they are going to vary quite massively from candle wax bought from here in this location to candle wax bought from another place somewhere else uh, so, you know, it's one of these things, if you're happy with it, you're happy with the cleanliness of it, 
you're happy with them, you know, how long your uh, components are lasting on it, stay happy. If it's a gunky mess, don't really continue with that. It will be slow uh, and it's obviously visually not going to be amazing on your drivetrain either and it's going to be a pain in the butt uh, to clean when you do want to try to get rid of some of that gunked up mess. Uh, if that's the wax experience that you have, move to a different wax experience because immersive waxing is still king for a number of sort of fairly unassailable reasons but only if you're on something that's not crap. Okay, so firstly, what wax did I buy? I bought uh, this uh, paraffin pillar wax from Aussie Candle Supplies. It's actually gone down slightly from when I bought it. Uh, when I bought it, it was $40 for five kilos. It is uh, now $38.50 for five kilos. I can't remember what shipping was. It wasn't crazy, but I'm obviously in, in Australia, it was it was you know relatively cheap uh, shipping. I don't think it was, I think, I think from memory, say around $20. So all up, uh, it's pretty cheap stuff. Uh, you get a whole lot of wax. Okay, so into test block one, Obviously, initial penetration uh, issues are not really a factor for an immersive wax. Uh, we can see so a wear rate of 5.3%. Uh, the average against the top tested waxes is 0.1%. So, you know, it is um, obviously clearly a higher wear result. But overall, 5% uh, wear rate basically in the first 1,000 kilometer block one. League table wise, that's actually quite a competitive result. Uh, if we look at the, and I've moved from average to median, thanks to a um, viewer suggestion on uh, the last uh, data, uh, last time we uh, went through data, <clears throat> um, they are at 5.4%. So it's it's obviously competitively matching uh, the median of uh, the wax strip lubricants tested, and you know nicely ahead of the median for the wet lubricants that we have tested. Moving on to block two, which is where we introduce some dry uh, contamination. So 9.5%, so it's gone up a bit uh, as opposed to block one, and it is still you know, a good bit ahead of, or sorry, higher wear than the average of the top commercial waxes. Um, and it has fallen behind the top, um, or the median of the top drip waxes that we've tested so far, but we do have some obviously very good drip waxes making up that result. Um, and then, uh, against the median of the wet lubes, however, it is miles ahead, as we know. And I've sort of banged on a fair bit that wet lubricants in the world of dirt and dust is not the right sort of product to purpose choice. Moving on to wet contamination block four. Uh, things are actually a fair bit closer here. So um, the candle wax was at 14.1%, the average of the top commercial waxes. And that is basically it's made up of uh, Malt Speed Wax New Formula, Silka Hot Melt, uh, Rex Black Diamond Wax 4 plus 1 mix and 11 plus 1 mix and Silka Hot Wax X. So, you know, it's impressively sort of close to the average there. It was, this average is the, the Rex Black Diamond 4 plus 1 and the uh, Hot Wax X. <clears throat> Both of those, those actually suffered in the wet contamination block. Um, so if you had seen the detail review on the, um, the Rex Black Diamond, the... Yeah, both that and the Hot Wax X were over 20% in the wet, wet Block 4 as opposed to extremely impressive results in the Dry Contamination Block 2. So there, there was quite a change, it seems like, when either sort of graphene or graphite or nanine um, and water may not be the best mix, and that's something that is under further investigation. Uh, but that did pull this average up. Um, the likes of um, M Speed Wax New Formula and Hot Melt are sort of you know, nicely under that average, so that means they're nicely under the counter wax average as well. Um, it's definitely ahead of the um, the median for the drip wax lubricants. Again, this is where immersive waxing, by way of you giving it a bath and therefore flushing out uh, the, a lot of the contamination that has been brought in by the the wet contamination um, being applied. That is something that applying more lubricant on top of your dirty chain just is going to comparatively struggle with. You know, that's really your inherent advantage of uh, immersive waxing. And it's yeah, still well, well ahead of the median for the wet lubricants tested through block four. All right, moving to the cumulative wear. 
Uh, so the previous graphs were the block by block for one uh, dry contamination block two and wet contamination block four. This is the total wear uh, through the main test of basically the blocks one through five. Um, so 5,000 kilometers of testing. I don't include uh, the extreme contamination block six in, in the, um, I guess what I call the main test and what I use to calculate the cost to run. Um, simply because so few lubricants actually make it uh, anywhere near to that, that, um, that using that there'd be just so much extrapolated data for many lubricants in there that it'd just be very messy. Um, at least most products get close enough uh, through the test that if I do need to extrapolate it's not getting too wacky, so we get overall pretty good data. So the 5000 kilometer main test, we've got candle wax with a total cumulative wear of 40.2%. Uh, the average of the top waxes uh, tested is 17.9%. And the median of the drip wax lubricants tested to date, 78%. And the median for the wet lubricants is obviously very, very high. <clears throat> so wet lubricants overall do really struggle compared to wax lubricants, which is likely why you know, either immersive waxing or wax strip lubricants really have dominated um, the market and what's coming out onto the market over the last sort of three to five years. Um, so yeah, I mean, overall, that is a very, very strong result. We'll duck across to the main data table just for fun. All right, let's have a look at some uh, picks at end of test. So here is the how things looked for the candle wax at uh, the end of uh, the 5,000 kilometers. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll bring up that versus the end of test for hot melt. Now, bear in mind also that hot melt had done the an extra 1,000 kilometers for the extreme contamination block, which I did not bother doing for the candle wax. Just the extreme contamination block takes a lot of time to slog through um, and really, I just want to get to the end of the uh, the 5,000 Ks for that one. So anyway, it's, a, it's another 1,000 kilometers uh, further in with a whole bunch more contamination thrown at it. Um, but that's kind of how that one looks as opposed to candle wax. You can see the candle wax. It is a bit more flaky. Um, so it's, it's overall, it's a little bit more uh, dirty. But, you know, not massively so. Again, compared to what we have seen out there, uh, this is the candle wax uh, cassette and as opposed to uh, hot melt So it looks sort of fairly similar ish on the cassette there um, <clears throat> Things can go a couple of different ways um, With the sort of DIY wax you may end up with some of the the paraffins uh, Especially the cheap stuff obviously can be quite uh, oily and gunky as we mentioned before mentioned before some can be quite brittle um, and flaky, uh, especially actually if you're going for some of the more refined like food grade ones. There's a whole lot of differences with regards to the softness and hardness grades of wax. And that's another part that's a bit of a lottery. And that's another part that the, uh, the top commercial waxes spend a lot of time getting their, their wax blend right and uh, the right base wax. So if it's too brittle and flaky, you will get a very short lifespan and things sounding and feeling quite dry quite quickly. If it's more oily, uh, sometimes people think, wow, these feel, feel amazing, but they are the ones that would be more likely to gunk up um, quite quickly over time and get more dirty. Uh, again, I really think I've uh, sort of stumbled onto an overall pretty impressive uh, candle wax. All right, let's have a look at uh, quickly some cost to run. All right, modeling based on um, the blocks one through five, so that includes the contamination blocks two and four, um, on Durace components, uh, so Durace 11 speed. So the candle wax has come out pretty darn impressive there. Uh, you can see one of the main things that's helping is we've got a lubricant cost, uh, usage cost there of $4. Um, so that is lower than anything else tested so far to date. So that has uh, sort of helped it. Um, there, but you know, combining with overall quite competitively low uh, wear rates. Uh, if I move down to modeling just based on uh, block two, now the components in this modeling change from Durace to the GRX 810 components, so it's a quite a bit lower cost of the components. So uh, that means that the wear rate doesn't impact the cost to run as much as it does with. Um, with the Durace, so it's uh, still overall performing 
uh, obviously extremely well. So sitting in fourth place there, rather low lubricant cost. Um, and then having a look at modeling based on uh, block four. So again, uh, it's the GRX810 level components, and it's again sort of sitting in overall uh, fourth spot. So um, from a purely cost to run perspective, um, this wax that is costing extremely little uh, and is overall this one's come out fairly clean you know it's uh it's obviously you know there are many products tested that would love to have uh i guess received the results overall that the candle wax has attained uh, both in you know really the main sort of block by block uh, and overall data as well as the cost to run data so what's the wrap all up on that all right so i'll duck back just up to the um results for the um, across the main test so the blocks one through five on the duress components if we have a look at the breakdown so we can sort of see let's have a look at the number of cassettes worn so uh, based on the wear rate across that um, that test we're looking at uh, basically 0 0.78 uh, cassettes worn in 10,000 kilometers as opposed to say hot melt and M speed wax and Rex black diamond 11 plus one at 0 0.4 so it's basically they are still half the chain and cassette and therefore chain ring wear rate. And that does give them a little bit of an advantage when we're multiplying out the total cost to run uh, for the duress components, also factoring in the higher um, lubricant cost. So but the, the gap was sort of either less or, or different when we looked at the cheap components with the GRX uh, 810. So something to bear in mind that so if we're looking at you know as a general ballpark average you might expect that the candle wax to be around double the wear of uh, the top tested immersive waxes uh, known at the moment if you know due to the very cheap price of this candle wax if your components are quite cheap um, you know this gap between the candle wax and say you know m speed wax new formula hot melt etc is going to be even closer um, <clears throat> there may be a point if the components are cheap enough that it pulls ahead if the components are more expensive so whilst durace 11 speed is not cheap it is by no means uh, in the ballpark of where some um, especially you know off-road cassettes are at, at the moment so uh, you know the, we can factor in maybe the latest t-type cassettes which in australia are uh, going to be around about 900 to 950 dollars and with an xx sl chain at around 250 dollars um, halving the wear rate for components costing that price then the advantage of the top commercial waxes uh, there are going to pull well ahead so you're still going to need to factor in your group set cost a fair bit with regards to how well this cost to run table relates to you uh, on that front, there has been some great progress with uh, Omni Calculator. Uh, so I hope within the next sort of week or two to be able to give uh, in one of the low friction updates um, a more deeper update on where things are at with Omni Calculator. Um, when that rolls out, which uh, will hopefully be not too far away, the cost to run modeling will be expanded out across um, more conditions and more group sets and the ability to put your own group set pricing in as well. So you'll be able to use the test data that we have without faffing around with um you know what block should you sort by or what what means what in the uh the main lead table um you'll be able to get uh the the modeling from the the wear test results uh for that your lubricant of choice and your writing uh type <clears throat> then yeah it's going to just be a, a much slicker and more usable um yeah thing for you to compare what's the right one for you but so, but overall, you know, obviously, again, um, if this was just a product that had been sent to me and I didn't know what it was, and overall this was the uh, the results uh, that came out for it, it would be ranked as a pretty impressive, um, you know, product on the market overall. And yet, it cost um, forty dollars for five kilograms, so it's uh, it's made a, a pretty good case for itself. Okay, yeah, so overall, um, my thoughts are is that yeah, I was really impressed. Um, I thought it was going to be uh, quite a lot worse, uh, especially at that price. So I actually pretty much set out to try to find, um, I guess, the cheapest sort of candle wax um, that I could 
you know obtained for the test um, with overall the, the plan that hopefully like if it was you know really quite poor that I've hopefully obtained at least you know I guess a wax that's going to be at least as poor as what one might expect to get if they are really shopping for this stuff on the cheap however uh, I did obtain something uh, overall fairly impressive despite um, the very cheap price so uh, Aussie candle making supplies uh, if you're uh, getting into the chain waxing business you've got uh, not a bad uh, product there so yeah so I, again um, my my fear is that uh, it's going to drive more people um, towards uh, a candle wax and not have the same experience but at the end of the day if that happens to you it's not the end of the world if, if you can tell that either a it's really you know sort of brittle and feeling and sounding dry quite quickly um, which if you keep writing it like that that could be giving you higher wear or if it's a gunky mess um, then you just know you need to sort of transition from that to a take two it's not the end of the world be that moving to something you know one of the, the sort of the top um, tested waxes or just trying a different uh, sort of you know candle wax base for your DIY waxing I would still believe even though I haven't uh, got a chance to test it yet still the default if you're going to do DIY wax especially if you're going to do DIY where you're looking to add um, some fancy additives then um, going to a refined paraffin base like say the golf canning wax is likely to be a safer bet than the randomness of um, what candle wax or cheap sort of you know hardware store paraffin you might get because it might be uh, similar to what I managed to get for this one it might be you know really nothing like that at all and and one of the sort of the anecdotal horror stories that, that um, you know us in the industry uh, have seen over time and that uh, poor bike stores get to deal with so um, yeah but I hope though that overall um, you found that interesting and this was sort of kind of maybe what you were uh, perhaps hoping for um, I don't know what you expected um, with the, <laughs> what the test results might be I didn't really know what I expected I thought that they were likely to be uh, worse and I expected that it was likely to be uh, dirtier gunkier um, you know sort of end result than, than what uh, attained in this one so yeah it was quite interesting to see that this one came out fairly impressive so yeah see uh we'll see how that goes it's um i i hope that the golf canny wax when i can get to that will um you know i guess give this a good run for money it will be kind of uh, odd if the golf canny wax uh, doesn't perform as well as the uh 40 dollars for five kilograms uh candle wax so yeah i don't know entirely when yet um things are running a little bit behind I am uh, still trying to get through uh, the single application longevity test on one machine for uh, Hot Wax X. Um, there's been a, a little bit of a pause because I've got to do maintenance now on a couple of machines. So I'm just trying to find time to get uh, that done before I can get a couple of machines spooled back up again. I still need to get yeah, the extreme um, contamination uh, single application longevity a uh, bit done for the Hot Wax X and then I can get the Hot Wax X uh, detail review done. Uh, but that just ran really really long because it just kept going and going and going in the uh, the dry uh, testing uh, for that and uh, I need to do a, a, a bit of work on the machine that's just finished the, uh, the candle wax uh, test as well and we've got some sort of fair bit of testing going so I'll try to get to the um, the, the canning one when I can but I'd, I'll try to get to it before the end of this year but I, I can't can't promise um, and I won't be doing yeah, the single application longevity test at this time for uh, the candle wax uh, that I've got. Again, just due to um, the, the amount of work we've got on, but I've, uh, I've, I've got nearly five kilograms of it. So if I can get a spot uh, going forwards, I will try to get back to doing the single application longevity testing for it as well to sort of round out the, uh, the full data picture for it. But I can tell you just from observations, um, it didn't appear, it didn't sound or feel like it was having any issues. Um, making the interval lengths uh, through the main test and they are still relatively long um, intervals so it, it was fine um, if you were using that you're not going to have an issue with treatment longevity um, and I had planned to today as well but I've uh, sort of run too long with things to give an update on the uh, the I guess the chain prep uh, product testing with the UFO drivetrain clean versus the traditional solvent 
and silk is stripper. So if you recall from the last one, so I'll do it very quickly, won't bother with the graphs, but uh, I'll try to do that next week. Uh, yeah, if you recall before holidays, we had concerns that there was an issue um, from the testing, um, which we weren't sure if it was the product or the chains. We've uh, finished uh, retesting um, with moving to the Altegra test chains for solvent, and I've finished testing um, for UFO drivetrain clean uh, on the Altegra chain. And yeah, things are um, fine. It was the chain that was the issue, so the UFO drivetrain clean um, has, let's say round one for that, has gone perfectly great. It was actually a little bit lower wear overall um, at the end of the six uh, 10 hour intervals than the solvent. So um, that sort of puts to, I guess, rest thankfully the concerns that I had after the first batch of testing with the, uh, the cheap SRAM chains. And the concerns I had there was that simply right from the start, even the first check measure, the, the variances in the, the, the measures for, that, for those chains were just really quite wide and, and well outside of what we're comfortable with. So those cheap chains are just not uh, sufficient quality to, to do the test, unfortunately. So I'm going to scrap those first three tests and the project sort of test restarts from now using the Altegra chains, which are what I use for the lubricant testing. So a uh, quick take to do over on that. Uh, so by next week, I should have hopefully the uh, Silka Stripper test uh, done as well. And then I'll be moving on to UFO Drivetrain Clean, uh, the second chain through the same 200 mil bath, and we'll keep that project going. Uh, but I'll have the pretty graphs uh, redone up for next week. All right, apart from that, I am out of time. Uh, thank you for watching. Hope you found it interesting. And I will um, yeah look forward to be back next week and try to bring more fun to the land of low friction. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you the next. Uh, see you on the next one.